Well, good morning and welcome. I appreciate you guys being here. So I'm going to spend about the next hour and a half with you or so. And um, I'm going to go over a concept that probably most of you have not heard about before. Um, and as I go through this, you're going to think, man, that looks really, really good. But it just looks way too good to be true, right? Have you guys ever seen something like that where you've been somewhere and you've watched somewhere and it looks really good, but it just seems too good to be true? Well, that is where I was back in 2006 when I first saw this for the very first time. I was actually at a chiropractic conference because I am a chiropractor. I no longer practice chiropractic anymore. I had five clinics in the Kansas City area. I sold the last one in 2017, and I haven't practiced since 2008. I had associate docs in my clinic. But anyway, I was at a chiropractic conference, and I heard this information that I'm going to share with you today, and I thought it looked really, really good, but I just thought it was too good to be true. So I left that conference, and I didn't do anything. I didn't take any action at all. And I went home, and about probably almost a year and a half later, the thing I did is I went back to another chiropractic conference, and about 10 or 12 of my colleagues that were at the previous one were now at this one. And so they were coming up to me, and they were saying, Brent, isn't that banking concept the most powerful thing ever to just like, um, you know, as far as just to create wealth in your family, to build wealth, to take your debts and your expenses and pay those off? all without having just to work any harder, without having to change your cash flow, without taking any additional risk or losing control of your money, all by simply adding one step. And I thought to myself, there had to be something to this, right? Because there's no way that 10 or 12 of my colleagues are lying to me, right? Maybe one or two are lying, but not 10 or 12. So I went home and I told my wife, I said, honey, I said, we got to start implementing this concept in our life. And at that time, it was February of 2008, and I was actually $984,711 in debt. That's what I owed to third-party creditors. Now, I know you're probably thinking, how does a guy from Kansas get to be almost a million dollars in debt, right? Well, anyway, I had my student loans from chiropractic college. I had my clinic. I had my house. I also had a house on the Ozarks, on the Lake of the Ozarks, between St. Louis and Kansas City. And if you have a house on the lake, guess what you have to have? A boat and a wave runner, right? I mean, right? The thing is, is that you have to have a boat and a wave runner if you live on a lake. I'm also an airplane pilot, so as a pilot, I had to have my own airplane. So it didn't take me a lot to become almost $1 million in debt, or almost a million bucks in debt. Well, I was able to take this concept and this process that I'm going to share with you today, and I was able to pay that debt off in 39 months, three years and three months. I never had to work harder, change my cash flow, take any additional risk, or lose control. All I did was add one step in my financial life. So all this stuff I'm going to go over with you today, it's not about how you invest or the stuff that you're doing right now with your money. Because again, right, so like a lot of you invest in what, stocks or bonds or gold or silver or houses, real estate, or even like antique cars, right? So I'm not going to tell you how to invest. All we're going to do is add one step before you make those investments, and it will drastically change your financial life forever. Okay, so as Larry said, I'm Brent Kessler. The name of our company is The Money Multiplier. I'm located down in Port Orange, Florida, which is about an hour east of Orlando. Um, I bumped right up next to Daytona Beach. Um, actually, in Daytona Beach, it was bike week last week, and my daughter Hannah here that you probably, uh, that, okay, yep, in the back there. So my daughter Hannah was working at bike week for, um, so like in a bar down there, right, during bike week, because she wanted to have something fun to do. So anyway, her voice might be not quite where it is because she yelled three-dollar beers for like four and a half days. <laughs> so, but yeah. So anyway, okay, yeah. So like our company is called the Money Multiplier, and um, okay. So the concept that I'm going to go over with you today, I just want you to keep an open mind as I go through this. I know you're going to have questions, but chances are, as I go through this, I'm going to answer most of those questions that you have. So I'm not going to take questions as I go through this presentation, but I will answer your questions at the end. So in order to remember your question, the thing I want you to do is write it down because you'll forget it, right? I always say a short pencil is better than a long memory. So write down the question to make sure that we go over it. Now, all of you guys should have this handout right here. Yes, does everyone have one of these? Is there anyone that doesn't? 
Okay, Hannah's going to bring him around to you. Just keep your hands up, and Hannah's going to bring him around. Now, who in here, who in here has heard me speak before, or this is the first time you've ever heard me? Raise your hand. Ah, just seeing if you guys are paying attention. All right. So anyway, Hannah's bringing around those handouts. So let's go ahead and get started. Let's, my clicker doesn't work. Larry said I'd run into these challenges. There we go. Yep. I've already told you who I was, how much debt I paid off. All right, now, I'm going to go over a couple books with you today. And these are books that you definitely want to add to your wealth building library. The first book is called Becoming Your Own Banker by R. Nelson Nash. Now, actually, R. Nelson Nash, it was, uh, yeah, it was like March of 2019 is when we lost him at age 87 years old. But anyway, this book completely changed my financial life. A lot of what I'm going to go through today is so based off of this book, this R. Nelson Nash book. So you definitely want to add this book to your financial library. I think um, so Hannah bought three or four of them. But if you're like me and just don't like to read, it's also got two hours of audio with it, too, if you got a little ADD like I do and you like to listen to the audio. But it's definitely a book that you should get and add to your library. All right. So anyway, there's another book here that I wrote with Chris Noggle, which you're going to hear from Chris on a different topic later today. It's called Mapping Out the Millionaire Mystery. So Chris is here, and he'll kind of you know, talk to you about his story. But Chris is very active in the real estate industry. He's had a couple shows on TV. His most recent one, HGTV, was um, a show called Risky Builders. So Chris is somebody you guys want to follow on social media, Instagram, Facebook, all of that. So just be watching what Chris does. Again, I'm not going to give away, okay, so like all the stuff he's going to go over. But, um, yeah, so Chris is out there everywhere. He does a Wealth Wednesday webinar every Wednesday at 1 p.m. Eastern time. He doesn't ask me anything at every Wednesday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern time. Again, I mean, I'm not big on um, as far as social media, so like, I have a hard time checking my email, all right? But again, he knows all about that stuff. He's on podcasts, different things. So you need to follow Chris Noggle. Well, anyway, Chris and I wrote this book together, and it's been out about a year now. And again, it was all his idea. Chris has been my client for several years. He was referred to me by another um, investor, a real estate investor, by a guy named Mike Baird that lives out in Salt Lake City, Utah. He, has, um, he used to have a TV show called Flip Man Mike. And um, so Chris has been my client for quite a few years. And then he said, man, this is awesome. I got to start teaching this stuff myself. So he does. Chris does a lot with this as well. Um, and uh, Chris said, he said, Brent, he says, the thing we got to do is we got to write a book together. I said, write a book together? I don't have time to write a book, man. Let me tell you, it was the easiest thing ever. Because all I had to do, I said, Chris, I'm not going to sit down and write, but I can tell you what I want to go in it. So that's all I had to do is I had to just tell the story. And then there was a writer that put it all together. And then I proofread it, changed this, changed this. It's the easiest thing ever. So if you guys are thinking about writing a book, it's not like you got to sit down and write the pages, right? You just talk what you want to have in the book, and they'll put it all together with the charts and the graphs. So I got to thank Chris for, you know, he was the one that really pushed to get this book done. So that's another book you may want to add to your wealth building library. However, if a, you send me an email to brent at themoneywalltiplier.com, B-R-E-N-T, it's on your first page of your handout, I will actually send you the ebook version. So there's no sense in buying the book. Just get the ebook. Send me an email, brent at themoneymultiplier.com, and I'll send you the ebook so you'll have that. So there you go. We took care of one of the books. So just to be totally clear of what I'm going to be talking about for the next 90 minutes. All right, so we're going to be talking about money. We're going to talk about how your money works. We're going to talk about the method to get all of your money back for all the products and services that you're buying currently. For example, before I end today, I'm going to show you how to get every dollar back on every car you're going to buy, drive, and own for the rest of your life. So what that means is not only do you get the car, but you also get the money back. Because, see, I don't even know most of you, but I know how you buy a car. Here's what you do. The thing you do is you go to the car dealer, and you either are going to buy the car through, um, the, okay, one of three ways. 
You're either going to pay cash for it, you're going to bank finance it, or you're going to lease it, right? So however you buy that car, the thing that you have to do is you have to give the dollars to the car dealer, and the car dealer is going to give you the car, right? So he's got the money, you have the car, transaction is over, everybody goes home happy, yes? Well, how about if there's a way that I can show you how to do exactly that, where what you're going to buy the car by giving him the money, he's going to give you the car, so he's got the money, you got the car, but now there's a system, a process, and a concept to get all of that money back. Would that be pretty cool? If I showed you how to get every dollar back for every car you're going to buy, drive, and own for the rest of your life. And if, and if I can do that for a car, guess what else I can do it for? A house, a boat, a bicycle, a computer, a cell phone, clothes, jewelry, right? It doesn't matter what it is. Every product and service, every, okay, what we're going to do is turn every liability into an asset, every depreciating asset into an appreciating asset. So I'll show you that before we end today. And also, you'll see how I paid off that $984,000 of debt in 39 months just by adding this one simple step. Okay, I'm going to play this video for you. It's called The Backward Bicycle. It's about seven and a half minutes long. And I just want to get your mind right because the stuff that I'm going to share with you is outside of the box thinking. It's not what your parents taught you about money, your grandparents, your friends, your colleagues, and your coworkers. So I'm going to challenge the way that you've been taught about money. And this video is a good thing to do to get it started. It's called The Backward Bicycle. And actually, you can go to YouTube and just click on The Backward Bicycle. And it's about seven and a half minutes. So am I good, Paul, to play this? Here we go. Hey, it's me, Destin. Welcome back to Smarter Every Day. You've heard people say it's just like riding a bike, meaning it's really easy and you can't forget how to do it, right? But I did something. I did something that damaged my mind. It happened on the streets of Amsterdam, and, and I got really scared, honestly. I, I can't ride a bike like you can anymore. Before I show you the video of what happened, I, I need to tell you the backstory. Like many six-year-olds with a MacGyver mullet, I learned how to ride a bike when I was really young. I had learned a life skill and I was really proud of it. Everything changed though when my friend Barney called me 25 years later. Where I work, the welders are geniuses and they like to play jokes on the engineers. He had a challenge for me. He had built a special bicycle and he wanted me to try to ride it. He had only changed one thing. When you turn the handlebar to the left, the wheel goes to the right. When you turn it to the right, the wheel goes to the left. I thought this would be easy, so I hopped on the bike, ready to demonstrate how quickly I could conquer this. And here he is, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Destin Salmon. First attempt riding the bicycle. All right. So, the faster I go, the better. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I sure. couldn't do it. You can see that I'm laughing, but I'm actually really frustrated. In this moment, I had a really deep revelation. My thinking was in a rut. This bike revealed a very deep truth to me. I had the knowledge of how to operate the bike, but I did not have the understanding. Therefore, knowledge is not understanding. Look, I know what you're probably thinking. Destin's probably just an uncoordinated engineer and can't do it. But that's not the case at all. The algorithm that's associated with riding a bike in your brain is just that complicated. Think about it. Downwards force on the pedals, leaning your whole body, pulling and pushing the handlebars, gyroscopic precession in the wheels. Every single force is part of this algorithm. And if you change any one part, it affects the entire control system. I do not make definitive statements that often. But I'm telling you right now, you cannot ride this bicycle. You might think you can, but you can't. I know this because I'm often asked to speak at universities and conferences and I take the bike with me. It's always the same. People think they're going to try some trick or they're just going to power through it. It doesn't work. Your brain cannot handle this. For instance, this guy. I offered him $200 just to ride this bike 10 feet across the stage. Everybody thought he could do it. No, 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 no. No, no you didn't understand. You didn't understand. So, this way. <laughs> All right, I'm just like, oh. All right, so, uh, whatever you're in. Yeah. Wait, wait. No, no, you have to keep your feet on. Dude, <laughs> 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 All right, let's get it together. Let's get it together. Wait, wait, Like, you gotta start rolling at least. <laughs> and go. Oh, God. <laughs> All right, back up. Okay, wait. Keep your feet on the pedal.
Once you have a rigid way of thinking in your head, sometimes you cannot change that, even if you want to. <laughs> so here's what I did. It was a personal challenge. I stayed out here in this driveway and I practiced about five minutes every day. My neighbors made fun of me. I had many wrecks, but after eight months, this happened. One day I couldn't ride the bike and the next day I could. It was like I could feel some kind of pathway in my brain that was now unlocked. It was really weird though. It's like there's this trail in my brain, but if I wasn't paying close enough attention to it, my brain would easily lose that neural path and jump back onto the old road it was more familiar with. Any small distractions at all, like a cell phone ringing in my pocket, would instantly throw my brain back to the old control algorithm and I would wreck. But at least I could ride it. My son is the closest person to me genetically and he's been riding a normal bike for three years. That's over half his life. I wanted to know how long it would take him to learn how to ride a backwards bike, so I told him if he learned how to ride a backwards bike, he could go with me to Australia and meet a real astronaut. Are you going to give up? No. Go ahead. This is how it starts. Look at this. This is such a big deal. Get up. You got it. Did you see his brain get it? So he, in how many weeks have we been doing this? Two weeks? In two weeks, he did something that took me eight months to do, which demonstrates that a child has more neuroplasticity, am I even saying that right, than an adult. It's clear from this experiment that children have a much more plastic brain than adults. That's why the best time to learn a language is when you're a young child. All right, today's bike log. I can ride smooth, I can ride fast. I'm thinking the experiment is over. Okay, now I'm in Amsterdam, a city that has more bicycles than people. The question is, can I ride a normal bike now? I mean, I've spent all this time unlearning how to ride a bike. If I go back and try to ride a normal one, will my brain mess up? So I've tweeted a Smarter Every Day meetup, if you will, and I'm going to see if somebody brings a bicycle and I'm going to try to ride a normal bike. It's backwards, it's backwards. This was one of the most frustrating moments of my life. I had ridden a normal bike since I was six, but in this moment, I couldn't do it anymore. I had set out to prove that I could free my brain from a cognitive bias. But at this point, I'm pretty sure that all I proved is that I could only redesignate that bias. So what you're not seeing is just a group of people here looking at me, looking at the strange American <laughs> that can't ride a bike because they think I'm dumb. But I'm actually two levels deep into this because I've learned and unlearned. All right. After 20 minutes of making a fool out of myself, suddenly my brain clicked back into the old algorithm. I can't explain it, but it happened in a very specific moment. <laughs> I got it, I got it, I got it. I'm back. Oh, it clicked. It clicked. Hold on, it clicked. I got it, I got it. Okay, there it is. There was the moment. Okay, I can ride a bike. I tried to explain this to the people around me, and they just didn't get it. They thought I was faking the previous 20 minutes, and I couldn't get anybody to believe me. That looked like I faked that, didn't it? Yeah. Just a fake. Yeah. You think I'm faking. You don't believe me. That's so weird. You were like, la, 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 and it's full. You think I'm lying, don't you? Yeah, I I'm not lying. I felt like the only person on the planet who had ever unlearned how to ride a bike, and I couldn't articulate it to anyone because everybody just knew that you can't forget how to ride a bike. So I learned three things from this experiment. I learned that welders are often smarter than engineers. I learned that knowledge does not equal understanding. And I learned that truth is truth, no matter what I think about it. So be very careful how you interpret things, because you're looking at the world with a bias, whether you think you are or not. I'm Destin. You're getting smarter every day. Have a good one. Okay, if you All right, the backward bicycle, pretty cool, yeah? So again, the reason I show you that is because I want to just to try to get your mind right because the stuff I'm going to go over with you is going to be a paradigm shift. It's not what you've been taught. And we'll one skip of through that. Anyway, there's a guy named Will Rogers, and here's what Will Rogers says. He says, the problem in America isn't so much what people don't know. It's what people think they know that just ain't so. So a lot of the stuff that you've been taught about your wealth and your money may not actually be the truth. So I'm going to challenge you on some of those thoughts as we go through this today. The thing we're going to talk about is how does your money flow. We're going to talk about the method to get all of your money back. But in order to do that, what we have to have is an agreement for the next hour or so on what the definition of money is. So if I ask you to tell me what is your definition of money, what would you say? Financial instrument, what else? A tool, a debt, a transfer. All money is is a means of exchange, is it not? That's all it is. It's just a means of exchange for products and services.
As a matter of fact, so, so every day, the thing we do with money is what? We exchange it for food, right? We take, we take money, exchange it for food for money, and money for food, car for money, money for car, house for money, money for house. That's all it is, is a means of exchange for products and services. So that's going to be our definition of money for the next hour or so. Are we good with that? Okay. Let's talk about the method. We're going to talk about the mysteries of money. We're going to talk about the machine that we're going to use to build our wealth. Now, for those of you who have not heard me before, this is going to kind of surprise a lot of you when I show you what is that machine that we're going to use to build our wealth. That's coming in just a minute. We'll talk about the mission. We'll talk about the marathon. So this is not a sprint. It's not a get-rich-quick deal. This is just something that you're going to want to add to your financial life. One step that you're going to want to add to your financial life, and it'll change your financial life forever. We'll talk about the millionaire and the movement. All right, now, I have three calculators here on my screen, okay? The one on the right is going to be your checking or savings account that I'm going to say that you have at a local bank. Okay, I'm assuming probably most or all of you have a checking or savings account at a bank. And I'm going to say you have $25,000 in that account. Okay, and it's and again, so that's going to be at your local bank and you've got $25,000 in there. And the bank is paying you 4% interest on that money. Yeah, right. I know, I know, I know there's no bank out there paying you 4% interest on the money. But I'm going to make believe that you found a really good bank, and that bank is paying you 4% interest on your money. And I'm going to be your local banker at that bank, and we'll just call me Banker Brent. And I'm going to say that you are in the market to buy a new car or a $25,000 car. And the thing that you do is you come into my bank, and you say, Brent, I want to take the $25,000 out of the bank that's going to earn 4%, and I want to go pay cash for the car. And I say, no, 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 no. You don't want to take the 25000 out of the bank that's earning four and go pay cash for the car. Instead, I'm going to make you a loan for $25,000, and I'm going to charge you 6% interest. Now, if we go to a bank to borrow for a car for $25,000, how long normally would we just take that loan for? I like that answer, five years or 60 months. And I got it right up there, right? So it doesn't matter if it's four years or 48 months or six years or 72 months. We're going to say it's five years or 60 months. So here's what I'm saying. The $25,000 that is in your checking or savings account earning 4%, I want you to leave it there, and I'm going to make you a loan for $25,000 and charge you 6% interest. And over the same equal time period, in this case, five years or 60 months, our bank is going to pay you more money on the 4% that you're earning than you will pay us on the 6% that you're borrowing. Now, is that a true statement? In other words, is it possible for you to make money all day long earning 4 at the same time you're paying 6 over the same equal time period? No, you guys are all shaking your head no. The same thing that I did when I was sitting where you are back in 2006, I said, no, man, that can't be possible. Because how can you make more money earning four at the same time you're paying six? Because I'm losing two, right? That's exactly the way that I thought of it. However, the banker is telling you the truth. So let's walk through it. So that $25,000 car loan at 6% for five years or 60 months. So the payment is four eighty three thirty two dollars a month. Well, we take the 483.32 times 60. That means over the course of those five years or 60 months, you're going to pay just about $29,000 for that car. You're going to pay $25,000 in principal and $4,000 in interest. Are you with me so far? That same money I told you to leave in the bank earning 4% over the same equal time period, five years or 60 months, you actually have a total of $30,525. Now, here's a question for you. Is this number right here, 30525 is that a larger number than the 28999 or do you guys in Pennsylvania and New Jersey do math differently than I do in Florida? It's a bigger number, right? Well, how can that be? How can that possibly be a bigger number? Because I'm earning four and paying six. Here's what's going on, okay? So the car payment, the car balance is okay, is going down. It's on a decreasing balance, right? Well, the money in the bank is going up. 
So, all right, you got one that's going down and the other one is going up. But our minds aren't programmed to think that way because what we think is if we earn four and pay six, we're losing two. We got to start learning how money works. Now, the same example works is if I'm earning 10% and paying 20%. The same thing works. You have more money earning 10 at the same time you're paying 20. So just go, all right? The thing is, the thing you can do is go um, just, okay, so like in a calculator, you can go check it out and, and you'll see that. But for this example, all I wanted to do is prove to you that you could make money earning four and paying six at the same time all day long. Are we good with that? Now, why is that important? There's a method to my madness here. The reason that's important is now we're going to talk about the machine that we're going to use to build our wealth. Are you guys ready for it? Yeah. It's going to surprise a lot of you. The machine that we're going to use to build our wealth is a whole life insurance policy in a mutual company that pays dividends. Now, I wish you guys could be standing where I am, am right now, and I wish you could see all of your faces because you're looking at me like Brent. What in the hell does a whole life insurance have just anything to do with me building my wealth? You're thinking, I know everything there is to know about whole life insurance, and nobody's ever told me this. As a matter of fact, a lot of you are saying, I have whole life insurance right now, and I didn't know I could use it to build my wealth. Well, why are we going to use a whole life insurance policy to build our wealth? Any ideas? Take out a loan? Loan, compound, compound interest, compound. tax benefits, yeah. pay yourself. All those are great answers. Here's the number one reason we're doing it, because this is what the wealthy do. This is what the rich do. As a matter of fact, the number one purchasers of whole life insurance in the world are conventional banks. Conventional banks own more in whole life insurance than all of their land and their buildings combined. As a matter of fact, since 2013, conventional banks have quadrupled the amount of whole life insurance they've purchased. Quadrupled, right? Now, again, okay, so the banks are buying whole life policies in a mutual company that pays dividends. It's not any whole life policy. It's a specifically designed a policy, a specially engineered policy that has high cash value right away, immediately. And my definition of immediately is within 30 days. So they're not buying term insurance. They're not buying variable. They're not buying universal. They're not buying index universal. They're buying whole life insurance in mutual companies that pay dividends. So all we're going to do is we're going to mimic and imitate exactly what the wealthy do. Because, again, how come banks are doing this, right? And, again, so banks are buying all this life insurance. Are they doing it just because they're stupid or they know something the rest of us don't know? They know something the rest of us don't know. So we're just going to mimic and imitate what the wealthy do. Because all of this information I'm giving you today, it's just not information that came from me. I didn't invent this, right? The guy that wrote this book, R. Nelson Nash, didn't create and invent this. It's been around for over 200 years. The Rockefellers, the Rothschilds, the Morgans, the Stanleys, the Barclays, this is how they build their wealth. This is how Walt Disney funded Disneyland. This is how Ray Kroc got McDonald's started. This is how Pampered Chef got started be just before Warren Buffett. So Joe Biden, the guy you guys voted for, Joe Biden, <laughs> Joe Biden has at least a half a dozen whole life insurance policies. He tells you he keeps no money in a conventional bank. He, he stores and builds his wealth inside of these policies. Don't take my word for it. Go look it up. So all we're going to do is mimic and imitate exactly what the wealthy are doing. And if uh, you don't believe the stuff that I'm telling you, go look something up called BOLI, B-O-L-I. It stands for Bank Owned Life Insurance. If uh, you go Google BOLI, the thing you'll see is over 100 plus pages that come up about how much whole life insurance conventional banks own and how much they are continuously just buying and adding just to their supply. All right, now let's go back to that 4 and 6%. Why is that important? Well, here's why. Because inside of the policy, inside of this insurance policy, the guaranteed growth rate is 4%. That's the guaranteed growth rate inside of the policy. Now, just is that 4% do you think it's taxable or tax-free growth? Tax-free tax -free growth. And tell me our largest eroder of wealth is what? Taxes. 
So, okay, that's the guaranteed growth rate in the policy is 4%. Now, that's assuming the insurance company does not pay a dividend. When the insurance company pays a dividend, it's higher than 4%. Now, I can't promise you the insurance company will pay a dividend this year, next year, 10, 20 years from now, but all the insurance companies I work with have been paying dividends for over 100-plus consecutive years. So do you think there's a pretty good chance that the insurance company is going to pay a dividend this year, next year, 10 years, 20 years from now? Yeah, but even if they don't, I'm only talking to you about the 4% without the dividend. Now, why is the 6% important? Because the 6% is the highest interest rate the insurance company is going to charge you to take a loan. So can we borrow money all day long at 4%, I'm sorry, all day long at 6% and earn 4 and make money? Absolutely. Are you with me so far? So that's why the 4 and the 6 are important. Okay, so let's move on. Yes, we can make money earning 4 while paying 6 we talked about the definition of money, which is what? A means of exchange. That's all it is. We exchange money for food, food for money, car for money, money for car, anything you buy for money. Gasoline for money, a hat for money, clothes for money, glasses for money, a coffee cup for money, right? Everything. It's, all it is is a means of exchange. Okay. Who believes in compound interest? Come on. Every hand goes up. You guys believe in compound interest. Let's talk about compound interest for a minute. The only way compound interest works is if your money sits still, right? So in other words, if I want this $20 bill to compound, I have to take the $20 bill, I have to take it down to the bank, and I gotta let that $20 bill sit there, right? Now it's gonna earn compound interest. But if I go get this $20 bill out, say in, I don't know, let's say a year, it's no longer compounding. A week, a month, a day, it's no longer compounding. So the only way that that $20 bill is gonna compound is if I leave it sit still. Now, motion is a natural law of God, is it not? Everything is in motion, right? I mean, I ate breakfast this morning. Pretty soon, my food will be in motion. The birds are moving. The birds are flying. The cars are going by. The airplanes are landing. I'm up here talking. My hands are moving. My lips are moving. Everything is in motion. Who would want to eat fish out of a stagnant pond anyway? Anyone? No, you don't want to eat fish out of a stagnant pond. Who went to the grocery store this week and went to the fresh produce section and bought fresh produce and brought it home? All right, the thing you did, you paid for it, you bought it home. Who bought any fresh produce this week that you don't intend on eating? No, you guys are going to eat all your fresh produce, right? Because if you don't, it's going to spoil and you're going to end up throwing it away and you just wasted your money, right? So everything is in motion. But compounding stops the motion. Now, who in here has an IRA or 401k? Yeah, all, okay, I mean, right, so quite a few of you. Now, okay, so the reason that you're putting money in that 401k or IRA is why? Because you want to have more later, right? Anyway, can I have, okay, like, again, I want you to tell me who, again, just by a show of hands, who has money in a 401k IRA? Do you do, sir? IRA. IRA. And so how old are you today? 22. And how long have you been putting money? Yeah, that's okay. I'll repeat his answers. 22. And so how long have you been putting money in that 401k or IRA? A few months right now. A few months right now, okay? And the thing you're going to do is you're going to continue to do that through your life, right? Now, so um, anyway, so who's controlling that money in the 401k IRA? You or someone else? Someone else is controlling it. Okay. Are there any guarantees that that money is going to be there when you go get it out? down the road. Are there any guarantees with your 401k or IRA? Well, there actually is one. It's guaranteed to never go below zero, but how exciting would that be if that actually happened? Wouldn't that suck? Absolutely. Okay. So again, there's no guarantees and someone else is, con is, is controlling it. Now, how long are you going to have to keep that money in there before you go get it out without paying the penalty or, or the tax? I'm sorry. 55. Or, or, I'm sorry. No, the penalty. How long? Until you're 55. Until you're 59 and a half, right? So until you're age 59 and a half. Now, so you're 22 now, and you got to go to 59 and a half. No guarantee someone else is controlling it. It's 37 more years. How's that sound? Pretty good right now? It, it doesn't sound as good when I put it that way. Okay, I'm just asking. Okay, now, so even when you go get that money out, the tax is going to still be there, is it not? You're going to have to pay tax on the money anyway. So really what you're doing is kicking the can down the street, and you'll pick it up later. In your case, 37 years, you're going to kick the can, right? 
for a couple of you may be different. Now, if you take it out earlier, you have to pay the penalty, right? Okay. Now, how come you guys put money in a 401k IRA qualified plan? Because that's what our parents taught us to do. That's what our grandparents taught us. That's what our friends, our colleagues, and our coworkers are doing. So we're doing what they do, right? Have you ever seen a limerick? You guys know what a limerick is? I always teach my kids about a limerick. There's this, it's a big bird, right, Anna? Is that what it is? It's, it's a, what is it? A monkey. All right, it's called a limerick. And have you ever seen the, the story of the limerick where the thing is, is that they follow the same thing, okay, all the other limericks do ahead of them. So there's this thing out there that, okay, the one limerick goes to the side of the cliff, and he jumps off the cliff to his death. Guess what the other limericks do? They all do it. They all follow up. So I always teach my kid not to be a limerick, right? Don't necessarily do what other people are doing. And as a matter of fact, watch what the masses of people are doing, and you go do the opposite, and you're probably going to end up being better off. I don't know. Just, just a thought. Okay, but let's get back to the 401k and IRA. There's no guarantees. There's somebody else controlling it. I want you to tell me everything you know about that 401k IRA qualified plan. Tell me every single thing you know about it. Wait, hang on. I'll tell you what you know. Okay, the thing you know is one of two things, maybe. The thing you know is if it goes up or down based on the quarterly statements that you get. And you may know if it's invested in a low, moderate, or high risk category. But other than that, you guys don't know crap about that retirement account, do you? Now, maybe one or two of you do, but most of you don't know anything. Okay, there's no guarantee someone else is in control of it. Now, I want to ask you a couple questions. I want to ask you three questions about that account. Are your dollars worth more today or in the future? Today. If you ever think about that, just think about how many candy bars you could buy 25 years ago for a dollar, how many you can buy today for a dollar, right? Are taxes going to go up or go down? Up. Yeah, up. That's the history, right, is that taxes go up, right? So like the president told us he campaigned on, I'm going to increase taxes, so you know taxes are going to go up. And just between you and I, all right, so like my own personal opinion, again, I mean, to me, it didn't matter who was the president, Republican or Democrat, taxes were going to have to go up regardless because someone's got to pay for all the crap that's going on. It's just now they're just going to go up way higher, probably at a faster pace. Okay, so taxes are going to go up because they have over the history. And even if they don't go up, the thing is we're taxed on more stuff all the time, are we not? For example, I speak all around the country on this topic, and I was in Denver, Colorado, not too long ago speaking. I guess it was before the pandemic, about a year and a half ago. And I was in Denver, Colorado. I came and I did a speaking event. Now, remember, Denver, Colorado is where I was. And I got done speaking. I got done early before I had to go back home. So I stopped in the store, and I went up to the store, and I gathered my merchandise, and I went up to the counter in Denver, Colorado, and I, and right, so I took all my merchandise and paid for it, and I could not believe the amount of tax they were going to charge me on the marijuana I was about to buy. I'm just kidding, sir. I'm, I'm just kidding. I'm, I, I really didn't do that. Please don't leave. All right. All right, so even if we're not taxed, high, right, if taxes don't go up, we're taxed on more stuff. The third question, if you have a choice to pay tax on the small amount of the seed or the large amount of the harvest, which one do you want to pay tax on? The small amount. I agree with all three of those answers, but all three of those answers you are violating by putting your money in a 401k IRA or qualified plan because you're giving up good dollars today to get paid with non-guaranteed dollars that are weaker in the future, right? You're compounding the tax, and then when you do pay the tax, you're going to pay it on the higher amount and not the smaller amount. I'm just trying to get you to think about what's going on, right? Now, let me ask you another question. Let's say we go to the store, because remember the definition of money is what? A means of exchange. So that means, so guess what equals money? Food, car, houses, bread, milk, steak. Let's say we leave here today and go to the grocery store, and we buy a loaf of bread and a gallon of milk. Are you going to wait 10, 20, 30, or 37 years to eat that bread or drink the milk? That would be crazy, wouldn't it? How about if we go buy a car or a house today? See, he's got a 401k and he's going to the bathroom to throw up right now. Because he, he just doesn't, he, he's like, I can't take it anymore. All right, so anyway, so how about if we buy a car or a house today? Are you going to wait 10, 20, 30, 35 years to drive it or live in it? That would be ridiculous. Why are you doing that with your money? 
You see, you told me all those things equal money. You see, people do things with money they would never do with things that money buys. You would never go buy a loaf of bread and put it in the freezer and wait 10, 20, 30 years to eat it, would you? But you'll put money in a 401k, an IRA, a qualified plan, and hope to get more later. Oh, but guess what? You tell me that, but Brent, if I put my money in there, I get a match, right? I get a match. Well, let's go with your theory. First of all, how can the match be guaranteed if the principal's not even guaranteed? That'd be my first question. But let's go with your theory and say that you get a match. So the thing that we do is we go to the store, we buy a loaf of bread, we bring that bread home, we put it in the freezer, and 10, 20, 30, 37 years later, we open up the freezer, and guess what's in there? Two loaves of bread. How much better is that second loaf of bread going to taste 37 years from now? It'll still be freezer burned, will it not? So I'm just trying to get you to think about what's going on with your money, okay? Let's move on. Now, oh, okay, last question, and I'll move on. I want you to think of everybody that you know at retirement age right now, and a lot of you in here may be at retirement age, but I want you to think of everybody you know at retirement age. How many people have you ever met in your life that are totally happy, ecstatic, elated, and joyful about how their retirement plan has performed for them? How many have you ever met? None. None. Good, I got one guy back there. Two. Two or, three two or three. There you go. How many's in the room? A hundred? There you go. One or two out of a hundred. So thanks for being honest, right? You guys don't know people because all of you know people that are at retirement age right now that are out at work, right? And they're working at retirement age, not because they have to be, or well, I'm sorry, not because they want to be, it's because they have to be because their 401k, their IRA, their qualified plan, their retirement plan, their pension did not perform like they thought it was going to, right? I'm just trying to get you to, to think. I'm not trying to tell you what's right or wrong. I just want you to think about it. All right, so let's talk about how conventional banks actually work. This is how your bank works. Whenever you put money into the bank of, of, of where we're at, Pennsylvania, whenever you put your money in the bank of Pennsylvania, the thing that you do is you put your money into the bank, and they're going to pay you interest on that money. And I'm going to assume you found a really good bank that's paying you 4% interest. Now, every time... You deposit money into the bank. That money becomes a liability to the bank, does it not? Because they owe you interest, yes? So how does the bank take your money and turn it into an asset? Loan it out. That's what banks do. They lend money out, right? So the thing that you do is you take your money and you put it in the bank. Now, don't get hung up on the $100,000 number. It doesn't matter the number. It could be $1, $1,000, a million dollars. The point I want you to get is, is, is that it's your money and you put it into the bank. And that money becomes a liability, but they turn it into an asset by loaning it out. So a loan is an asset to a bank, is it not? But to us, if, a, if, if a, we think of a loan, guess what we think of it as? A payment, a debt, an expense, a liability, yes? We have to start thinking of a loan as an asset the way a bank does. So here's what happens with the bank. Anytime you put money into the bank, now the thing you do is you go to the bank and you want to buy a house. Who in here has a house mortgage or has ever had a house mortgage? Quite a few of you. So the thing you do is you put money into the bank and you go back to the bank and say, Mr. Banker, I want some of the money I deposited there and I want to borrow it to buy a house, okay? Okay. So they say, okay, we're going to lend you the money at 7%. Don't get hung up with the interest rates. I want you to get the concept. So if you borrow money from a bank to buy a house, are you expected to pay them back with interest? Yes. Absolutely you are. So who's in control of that transaction? The bank. Who in here besides myself has ever went to a bank to borrow money to buy a car? Same thing. So now you go buy a car, we'll call it 8%. And if you borrow money from a bank to buy a car, are you expected to pay them back with interest? Yes. So who's in control of that transaction? How about a house remodel, what, right? Maybe you want to get a HELOC loan. Maybe you want to put a new granite countertop, a swimming pool, a basement, a patio, right, on your house. you got to go borrow the money from the bank. We'll call it at 9%. It's got to be paid back to the bank, does it not? Yep. So can you see here how all the money is always in motion? It's constantly moving in and out, right? So that's why earlier that I said if I took that $20 bill down to the bank, and I gave them a $20 bill. And for example, if I highlighted it and I put my initials on it, if I give them that $20 bill right now and I go back in a day, are they going to give me the same $20 bill back? Nope. Nope. No, 
because it's in motion. It's constantly moving, okay? So the bank doesn't take my $20 bill, okay, that is, like, highlighted and has my initials on it. The bank does not go to the back room, and there's not a little box back there that says Brent Kessler, and that's where they keep the money until I come back and get it. If I go back in a day, an hour, 15 minutes, that $20 bill is gone. So that's what banks are doing. They're moving money in, moving it out all the time. It's constantly in motion. Are you with me? Last thing here. Let's say we're going to pay off all the credit cards, do a debt consolidation loan. We'll call that 12%. Well, if you do that, that money has to go back in the banking system, does it not? So who's in control of every one of these transactions? The bank is in control. Now, I know it's early on a Saturday morning. We're going to do a little math. I know that scares a few of you, but we'll keep it simple. So we're going to do some math. What we're going to do is we're going to look at to see how well you did and how well the bank did. Now, remember, I said you found a really good bank that's going to pay you 4% on your money, right? So now the bank's paying you 4 but now the thing they're going to do is they're going to take that money and they're going to loan it to you or somebody that wants to buy a house at 7 So if the bank made 7 and you made 4 how much more did they make? 3 Good. It's pretty easy, isn't it? Now the car is 8% and they pay you four. So they made eight, you made four. How much more do they make? Four. You guys are doing good, man. Nine minus four is what? Five. And finally, here's the tough one, 12 minus four, eight. I get a lot of times some people say nine. 12 minus four is eight. So 8%, right? So look at this. The bank made 20% and you made 4%. The bank made 20 and you made four. So how much more did the bank make than you? 16%. Close. What about 500% more than you? Because look, if you made four and they made 20, so didn't they make five times what you made? Yep. Banks are making between 400 and 1300% annually on the money that you leave there. Now, I know some of you are saying, Brent, I hear you up there flapping your gums and moving your lips. How do I really know that's true? Well, here's what you can do. You can go look up any bank that you want. Go to this thing called Bauer, B-A-U-E-R, BauerFinancial.com. You can pull up any bank that you want. You can pull up a big bank that we all know the names of, a small little hometown bank, and you will see on that annual report, I don't care if you get the report from this year, last year, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, you will see on that annual report banks make no less than 400% annually on the money you leave there. Now, I challenge you to do that. I've been speaking on this topic for nine years and one month now. That's how long I've been speaking on this topic. And uh, every audience, I say, go find me a bank that makes less than 400% annually on the money that you leave there. And, and I want you to bring it to me, and I'll change my presentation. Nobody's done it yet, right? But if you think about it, this makes sense. Because every time you drive down the road in a town, no matter what town you live in, and the thing you're doing is going through the main section of town and you get to the stoplight and there's four corners on the intersection, right? Tell me what at least one building is you see on at least one of those corners. Bank. A bank. And are the banks on the bad location, rundown architecture, landscaping, or are they the nicest buildings in town? They're the nicest buildings in town. And they're everywhere. Have you guys ever been driving down the road and you're like, oh, there's a new building going up. I wonder what that's going to be. A restaurant, a pub, a clothing store, and two and a half weeks later you go by and it's what? Another bank, right? So they're everywhere. And anyway, banks are, okay, so like if you go inside, they're all nice and clean and neat. The people are neat and smiling, most of them, if you can see them through the mask, right? But, <laughs> but right? And, and then two, all right, so, okay, so the thing is, is that banks sometimes give you stuff, don't they? Coffee, soda, cookies. They used to give you toasters. You guys remember that, right? So banks give you stuff. As a matter of fact, there's a bank in our town that if you go there on a certain day of the week, they give you wine. Yeah, on a certain day of the week, they give you wine. So guess, so, so guess what day my wife goes to the bank three or four times a day? Yeah. That's why she's not here today. She's hungover. All right. So yeah, they're everywhere, right? So who's paying for all those? We are. Now look, all of these transactions up here. So who's in control? The bank's in control of every one of these transactions. And my next question is, how much risk did the bank take to do all of this? They didn't take much at all because whose money did they use? They used your money, so they really didn't take any risk. Now, I will agree interest rate offsets risk, right? So the higher risk that you are as a borrower, the higher the interest rate is they're going to charge you. But if you're too high of a risk, are they going to lend you the money anyway? No. 
No. I'm just trying to get you to think about what's going on. So all I want you to do is to be the banker in your own life because you guys are doing all this anyway. You're buying houses, you're buying cars, you're doing house remodels or real estate, you're using credit cards. Who's getting all your money? All right, let's move on. Now, oh, there it is. There's the resource, bowerfinancial.com. Um, if you find a bank that makes less than 400% annually on your money, let me know, and I'll just change my presentation. Let's talk about how you spend your money. See, I don't even know most of you, but I know how you spend your money. Let's go through this. You spend about 20 cents of every dollar goes to cars. Now, I'm not saying just the car. I'm saying the gas, the insurance, the maintenance, the upkeep. 20 cents of every dollar is what you spend on a car. You spend about, uh, let's see, about 30 cents of every dollar goes to housing, all right? And you spend 40 cents of every dollar goes to everything else you do in your life to live. Your travel, your food, your entertainment, your taxes, your charitable giving, all right? So the thing we're doing is we're spending 90 cents of every dollar goes out to other people, and we're trying to save 10 cents or 10%, all right? Now, are you aware of what the average rate of savings is in America today? On average, how much are people saving? Yeah, I hear one, two. Actually, um, okay, so prior to the recession, it was a negative number. But since the recession, people have started to hunker down, and now it's between 5 and 6%. So I'm going to say you guys are all above average, and you're saving 10 cents or 10% of all of your money. Now, how do I know that you guys are all above average? Because before I came here today, I talked to Larry and Phil, and they said, Brent, this is an above average group you're speaking to today. That's how I know you're above average. Okay, so I'm going to say that you're saving 10 cents of every dollar. Now, whenever, okay, all right, so whenever the people talk to you, such as a financial a coach, planner, or advisor, right, so when they come to you and talk to you about your money, they're talking to you about the amount of money that you're saving, are they not? and they're trying to get you a higher rate of return on what you're saving. But in order to do that, that involves a little more risk, does it not? And in today's economy and environment, how much more risk do you really want to take with your money? Probably not a lot. Here's where I'm different. I'm not going to talk to you about the amount that you're saving. I'm going to talk to you about the amount of money that you're already spending. And if I can just take some of that money that you're spending and move it into your savings category, then haven't I just increased your savings without you working any harder, changing your cash flow, taking any additional risk, or losing control? For example, let's say you're spending 20 cents of every dollar goes to cars, and now we take that from 20 to 15, and we take that five, and we move it to savings, and it goes from 10 to 15. Haven't I just given you a 50% increase on your savings? All without working harder, changing your cash flow, taking any additional risk, or losing control. Adding one simple step. Let's talk about what you spend in interest. You spend five cents or 5% of every dollar goes to interest on automobiles. Now, I know a couple of you in the room, guess what you're thinking? You're thinking, not me, Brent. I don't spend any interest on automobiles. I pay cash for all my cars. That's what you do. You give me a, a chest bump like that. You say, I pay cash for all my cars. And you're proud of it. You're proud to say you pay cash. Well, OK, so there's only two reasons that you pay cash for a car. Number one is because no payments. That's why you pay cash, because you don't want to have any payments. And number two, because you don't want to pay any interest. Well, is that really true if you pay cash for a car that you have no payments? Well, I'm going to make believe this is a $20,000 bill, and we're going to buy a $20,000 car. Now, the thing you can do is you can go to the car dealer and give them a $20,000 bill, or you can make payments of 1000 a month for 20 payments. Either way, you have a payment, don't you? Because whether it's one or whether it's 20, you still have a payment. So, and so how do you like to do things? Just on a random basis, or do you want to have it structured? Because even if you pay cash for the car, you still got to save for the next car, do you not? So, all, right, all right, so anyway, sir, how old are you? 45. So you've been driving for probably about 30 years. The very first car you started driving, is that a car you still have today? Your second car. Maybe not even your third. So the point is, is that, is, that, is that the thing you've done is you've went through life and you've bought and sold cars, right? Yeah. Okay. So the car you're driving is not your last car. You're going to buy another one. So even if you paid cash for that car today, you've got to save to buy the next car. Do you not? Yeah. Are you with me? Okay. 
So the other reason is interest. So what you guys say, I don't pay any interest when I pay cash. Well, is that really true? Because if I took this $20,000 bill and I went and paid cash for the car, that $20,000 bill before I bought the car was in my account earning interest somewhere, was it not? I was earning something on that money. But when I have to give that $20,000 to the car dealer, where is that $20,000 now? It's gone. It's left my family forever. It is gone forever. So I've given up all earning right on that money. So even though in your mind you're thinking, hey, I didn't pay interest on the car, you gave up the interest that you could have been earning. Are you with me? Yeah. So just trying to get you to think what's happened. The thing I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how I buy a car. I take the car, and I'm going to pay cash for it. Okay, I'm going to pay the 20000 but the 20000 never left my account. It never left my account. It's still in there compounding and growing, even though I gave them the money, and I'm able to get it all back. I'm able to have the car and the money as well. Would that be pretty cool? Yeah. We're going to show you that pretty soon. Let's talk about housing. So what you guys spend 25 cents of every dollar goes to housing, okay, in interest. Now, I want to drive this point home because it's important. 25 cents of every dollar you spend on interest in housing. So who in here has a house mortgage right now? Yes, sir. You have a house mortgage. And tell me what your interest rate is. What's the rate? 5.2, .2, right? 3, 4, 5, 6%. It doesn't matter, right? So 5% interest on the house. Well, I want to ask you a question. Every month, all right, okay, the thing is every month when you get in, okay, the statement, it tells you how much your total payment is on that house each month, right? And it's generally the same amount every month, is it not? So I want you to think of the statement that just came in the mail this past month. On the interest portion of the payment, because remember, on the payment, it has a total payment, and it has two sections. It has a principal portion and an interest portion. So on the statement that just came in the mail this past month, so, all right, so was the interest a portion of that total payment? Was it 5% of the total payment, or was it a lot more? The interest portion. What do you guys think? More. It's more. We got to go home and look at the statement. As a matter of fact, in the first seven years of a 30-year mortgage, over 80% of your total house payment goes to interest. All right? In the first seven years of a 30-year mortgage, over 80% of your house payment goes to interest. Guess how long the average person stays in the house before they sell it or refinance it? Five to seven. How long have you been in your house? Okay, but you've owned it for 15. Have you ever refinanced it? No. What about your last house? Okay. Who else has a house mortgage? Who else? Why show hands? How long have you been in your house? A year. What about your last house? Five years. So five and six. Five and one is six. Six divided by two transactions is three. How long have you been in your house? 24. Have you ever refinanced it? How many times? One time. One time ever. Two times. So that's three transactions in 24 years. He bought it, refied, refied. 24 divided by three is eight. So I can play the game and go around the room. It's going to be five to seven years on average that you guys have either bought and sold the house, moved in or moved out it, or refinanced it, right? But we all get hung up in that 5% interest rate, three, four, five, six percent interest rate. We think that that's a good rate, but it's not the rate that's killing us, is it? It's that volume of interest that you're paying out. And all that volume of interest is going to where? It's going to the banks. And finally, we spend five cents of every dollar goes to living expenses. So what we're doing is spending 34 and a half cents of every dollar goes to other people, and we're trying to save 10%. Can you see how it might be a little hard to get off the financial hamster wheel doing that? You with me? Okay, here's the fun stuff. Now, everybody's got this handout right here? Everyone's got this handout? Okay, now, all the rest of the stuff's going to be on the handout or the next two things I go over. I'm going to now show you how to buy all the cars that you're ever going to buy, drive, and own, and not only do you get the money back, you get the car. Would that be pretty cool? Yeah. All right, because I'm going to ask, um, okay, anyway, I'm going to ask you a question. Okay, sir, I'm going to ask you a question. How old are you today? Sixty. So you've been driving for about 45 years, right? You've been driving for about 45 years. And that very first car that you bought, is that a car that you still have today? Yes. You do? Yeah. You got your very first car? That's cool. 
the 66 Chevy uh, Impala. Okay, I always pick on the wrong guy. But anyway, that's okay. <laughs> but anyway, actually, so, so actually, so I did, all right, so did the both of us have this conversation before one time? No. No? Okay. So, okay, the very first car that you bought. Now, is that the only car you drive? No. No. Do you have other cars? Three other cars. Now, those three other cars, have you owned them since 1966 too? No. No. Okay, so those other three cars as you've gone through life, have you bought a car, sold a car? Yes, sir. So how many cars would you say you've bought, driven, and owned since 1966? Six. You've bought six cars, uh -huh. okay? Do you think you'll ever buy another car the rest of your life? Have to. You have to, mm -hmm. okay? Yeah, because that 66 Chevy's probably wearing out right now. Oh, yeah. All right, so anyway, so yeah, you'll probably buy other cars. Out of all the cars you've ever bought, driven, and owned up to this point in your life, how much of the money do you have today? Here's a little hint. Zero. Zero, right? So if I do nothing else but show you how to get all the money back for all the cars you're going to buy, drive, and own, okay, from now until the time you graduate, mm -hmm. which is the same as die, between now and the time you graduate, would that be pretty cool? Yeah, so you have the car and the money. Okay, let's go through it. Now, remember I said what the machine was? The machine is a whole life insurance policy in a mutual company that pays dividends. So, yes, you have a death benefit. This is life insurance. But are we doing this today because of the death benefit? No. We're not meeting here because of the death benefit. We're meeting today to talk about the cash in the policy. So the thing you do is you put premium into the policy. You pay premium. In this example, this guy's going to put in 10000 a year for seven years. That's what he's going to put in. Now, I'm never going to tell you how much to put in to your policy. I've never told Paul, Larry, Linda... Right, Fred, I've never told any of you guys, whoever here is already working with me, have I ever told any of you that's just how much to put in? No. You decide the amount of money you want to put in. In this example, this guy's going to put in $10,000 a year. Okay? So that's a premium, and I call it a deposit. Is it really a deposit? Well, no, it's a payment because you've got to send money to the insurance company to have the policy, so it's a payment. However, if it's going into an account that you control and you have immediate cash to use right away, is it treated more like a payment or a deposit? A deposit. And tell me what word you like better, payment or deposit? Deposit. And have you ever made too many deposits in your bank account? Never. Okay. So there is a premium. Age doesn't matter and death benefit doesn't matter because I'm not sitting here today talking to you about age and death benefit. We're only going to talk about the cash. Now let's blow this up a little bit. On the left hand of the screen is just time. It's just years. Year 1 to 8, 9 to 13. You've got age and you've got death benefit. And can you see how those columns are grayed out? That means I don't want you to worry about age and death benefit. I only want you to look at this cash column. But I know there's at least one analytical person in the room that's like, Brent, I've got to know about age and death benefit or I won't hear anything else you say. So let me explain real quick. Let's say you have three people. They're all in equal health. And they're all different ages. We'll call them age 20, 40, 60, 30, 50, 70. It doesn't matter. So they all walk into the same life insurance store today, and they're going to put in $10,000 into their premium. Who's going to have the most death benefit? The youngest one. That just makes sense, right? Who's going to have the least death benefit? The oldest one. That just makes sense, right? Age, the age, the amount of premium that you're putting in is going to affect the uh, death benefit, assuming they're all in equal health, right? So I'm talking to you, though, about cash. So let's take the same example with cash. Those same three people, age 20, 40, 60, age 30, 50, 70, they all have a $20 bill in their pocket. They're going to walk into the same grocery store at the same time with $20. Who's going to be able to buy the most groceries? All the same, right? Because it doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter how you look. It doesn't matter the color of your skin, the language you speak, how good you look, how bad you're dressed. The same $20 buys the same amount of groceries for all of those people, does it not? So does, okay, so does age matter when we're talking about cash? No. 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 And I'm going to drive this point home because after I'm done, you guys are going to start asking questions. And guess what you're going to say? I'm too old to do this. I wish I would have done it before. No, you're not too old. It's only the age is only going to affect the death benefit number. That's it. It's not going to affect the cash number at all. Are you with me? Okay. Now, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to put in $10,000 a year for seven years into this policy. Okay. And I'm going to go buy a car. I'm going to, okay, the thing I'm going to do is borrow money from the policy to go buy a car. 
they, they told me that my clicker might stop working. Let me see. Here we go. I'm going to go buy a $25,000 car, Paul. My clicker's not working. I'm going to buy a $25,000 car. Do I touch this? It's up? Okay. All right. So anyway, I'm going to go buy a $25,000 car at the end of the third year, beginning of the fourth year. Are you with me? Now, I would never have you wait to the end of the third year, okay, or the beginning of the fourth year to start using the cash in your policy. I want you to use it immediately. My definition of immediately is within 30 days. Are you with me? But in this example, I'm going to wait till the end of the third year, beginning of the fourth year, to go buy a $25,000 car, okay? Now, I'm going to buy that car, and I'm going to pay myself back with interest. I'm going to pay $500 a month or $6,000 a year for a total of $30,000. So I'm going to borrow $25, pay back $30. Borrow $25 and pay back $30. Now, let me ask you a question. Do you think it's a good idea if you borrow money from yourself that you pay yourself back with interest? Yeah, yeah. It's a great idea, but do you ever do it? No, no man. You, you never do it. The thing you do is you put money in the bank, and you go take the money out, buy the crap that you want, and you never pay yourself back with interest, much less pay yourself back at all, do you? So you got to start paying yourself back with interest the same way you would pay a bank back with interest. Because if you borrow money from a bank, are you paying them back with interest? Absolutely. So you got to start treating your money the same way you treat a bank's money. Because if you don't, then you're saying your money is not as valuable as a bank's money. Are you with me? Okay. Now, he's going to pay 25. He, okay, okay, the car's 25 and he's going to pay back 30. Now, let's look and see what we did here in the first eight years. So here's what he did. He put in 10 times 7 is 70. He paid himself back 6 times 5 is 30. Or, uh, yeah, he paid 6 times 5 is 30 for a total of 100,000. But he took out 25 to buy the car. So we put in 100 and he took out 25. He put in 100 and took out 25. So how much more then, okay, so how much more did he put in compared to what he took out? 75,000. I agree with that number. 75,000. How much cash does he have in his account right now? 73,226. So if you take 73,226 in your calculator, you divide it into 75,000, that means he just got back 96% or 96 cents of every dollar for that very first car. How would you like to have 96 cents back of every dollar? Because how much do you have now? Zero. Is there anything stupid, ridiculous, or idiotic that I'm doing here? No, man. I just added one step in my financial life. One step. I added this policy and now I'm going to buy the cars with my policy. Now, so that car wears out. So the thing is, we go buy another car five years later in year nine. So either that car wears out or your spouse is tired of walking for the last five years and they want a car of their own now, right? However it is in your family. So now we go buy another car for 25000 in year nine. That 25000 comes from where? The 73226. Now, I want you to look at year 9 to 13 to see what we do. I'm no longer putting premium into the policy in this example. All I'm doing is I'm going to buy the cars. I'm going to buy a $25,000 car, pay myself back. Buy a $25,000 car, pay myself back, okay? I'm going to pay myself back the same amount I was paying before, $500 a month, $6,000 a year for a total of $30,000. So let's see what I did between year 9 and 13. So how much should I put in? A total of 30. How much should I take out to buy the car? I put in 30, took out 25, put in 30, took out 25. How much more did I put in than I took out? $5,000. How much cash do I now have? 95,000. It grew from 73 to 95,000, which is a $22,000 growth with a $5,000 net injection. How do you like buying cars my way? And on the handout I gave you, I show you two more, and it just gets better with time. Is there anything stupid, ridiculous, or idiotic that I am doing? at all by buying these cars. All I've done is I bought a stupid ass life insurance policy. Oh, you guys are saying, Brent, why did you say the word ass? Because three of you were sleeping and now you're awake, thanks. I, I don't know what it is about the word ass, but it'll wake you up. All right, so now you guys are all with me. So let's see what we did over 13 years because how fast is 13 years going in your life? I mean, I'm 53, it's, it feels like just yesterday I was 40. How would you say you were 64? 60. Sorry, I didn't mean to put four years on. But, but, but it probably feels like just yesterday you were 47. Does it? Okay, so it goes by quick. See, time is going to pass anyway, and you're going to buy the cars anyway. 
and you'll probably buy more than four cars since 1966. <laughs> Most of you. So the next time, can you sit in the back and I won't pick on you? All right. All right. So now let's see what we did in 13 years. We put in 10 times 7 is 70. 6 times 5 is 30 for a total of 100. We put in 6 times 5 is 30 for a total of 130. So 130 is what we put in, have we not? But we took out to buy two cars, 25 here and 25 there for a total of 50. So if I put in 130, took out 50. Put in 130, took out 50. How much more did I put in than I took out? 80,000 is my true net injection. How much cash do I have? 95. I want to make sure I understand what you're telling me. Are you saying through 13 years I put in 130,000, I bought two cars for 25 and 25, a total of 50, so my net injection is 80, and here I am sitting here today in year 13 with 95,000 in the account. If that's true, how much did those cars cost you to buy, drive, and own? They didn't cost you anything, right? The way my simple mind thinks is they cost me nothing because I put in 130, took out 50, my net injection is 80, and I've got 95. Not only do you have the 95,000, guess what else you have? You have two cars, that too, that too, death benefit too, but a five-year-old car and a 10-year-old car that you've owned, driven, and used for all that time. You can continue to own, drive, and use it. You can sell it, donate it, or give it away, right? So, but I can't sit here and tell you those cars cost you nothing because you had to start up here in the first year, and when you put in 10000 was that whole 10000 available? No, but are you in this for the short term or the long term? You tell me long-term, but we tend to get hung up in short-term thinking, do we not? Have you ever read a book called A Purpose-Driven Life by Rick Warren? In that book, Rick Warren says, life is like a marathon. It doesn't matter where you start. It only matters how you finish, and this is the game of life. So did I just show you how to get all your money back for all the cars you're going to buy, drive, and own? Is there anything stupid, ridiculous, or idiotic that I did? No, I just bought a I just bought a stupid life insurance policy, and I'm using it to buy the car. Now, I showed you how to do this with a car. Why do I talk to you? And I know I'm in a group of investors, real estate people, and you're thinking, Brent, why do you show with a car? Because I teach this all around the country, and all my audiences aren't real estate investors, because cars you all can relate to, because I bet everyone in this room has either owned a car, driven a car, or ridden in a car, right? So you guys understand cars. But let's say this wasn't a $25,000 car. Let's say if it was a $50,000 car, and instead of you paying $6,000 a year back, you're paying $12,000 a year. What would happen to the numbers? They would go up, wouldn't they? They would increase. What if mama and daddy had a $50,000 car? What would happen? Huh? The numbers would go up, wouldn't they? They would just increase. Well, if I can do this for a car, can I do it for anything else? Can I do it for a boat, a bicycle, a computer, a cell phone, a house, a vacation? Can I do it for taxes? So can I pay all my taxes, my state, federal, local taxes, and get all the money back? Absolutely you can. How about charitable giving? Can you give to charity and get all your money? Oh, a couple of you are thinking, Brent, that ain't right. God does, not want my, God does not want me to get my charitable giving back. Well, let me just tell you, if God did not want you to get your charitable giving back, he would not have me standing on this stage teaching you how to get it back, and he would not have you in the room uh, just, uh, right? He wouldn't have you in the room just learning how to get it back, would he? Are there any poor people that you know adding wings to any churches? Neither do I. So it doesn't matter what it is. We're taking every liability and turning it into an asset. We're taking every depreciating asset and turning it in, into an appreciating asset. We're now recycling and recapturing all of that money that has been going out to other people. Have you ever heard of a guy named Robert Kiyosaki? He, yeah, so anyway, he wrote a book called Rich Dad, Poor Dad. That's what he's famous for. But he also wrote another book called Second Chance. In that book, Second Chance, this is exactly what Robert Kiyosaki talks about. But you guys never saw it when you read it. You skipped right through it, didn't know what it meant. Have you ever heard of a guy named Tony Robbins? Yeah. He, he wrote a book called Money Master the Game. Money Master the Game. Chapter 5.4 of that book, this is exactly what Tony Robbins talks about but you never saw it when you read it. You see, as I said earlier, this concept isn't brand new, all right? So I didn't invent it. The guy that wrote this book, Nelson Nash, didn't invent it. It's been around for over 200 years. So all we're gonna do is mimic and imitate what the wealthy do. Now there's three rules. Rule number one, pay yourself first, meaning put the money into the premium, pay yourself first. Now you guys have all heard 
the term pay yourself first, but it goes in one ear and out the other. You guys never do it. See, I don't even know you, but I know what you do with your money. Every time you get your money in, every time it comes into you, whether it's active income, passive income, investment income, you take that money and you put it into the conventional bank of Pennsylvania or wherever you live, right? And then uh, after you put it in the bank, guess what you do with it? You pay everybody else first. You pay the house people, the car people, the student loan people, the taxes, the travel, the food, right? The charitable giving, and you hope there's money left over for you. You pay for Bobby's soccer practice, Susie's piano lessons, and hope there's money left over for you. You got to change that. You have to pay yourself first, and then after you pay yourself, then go pay those other people that you've been paying. Rule number two, pay yourself with interest. Treat your money the same way you treat a bank's money. Because if you borrow money from a bank, all of you guys pay them back, and you don't skip a beat, do you? You pay them back with interest. So treat your money the same way. Just pay yourself back with interest. And rule number three, recycle and recapture all of the money that's going out to other people. Turn every liability into an asset, every depreciating asset into an appreciating asset. Three rules. Pay yourself, pay yourself with interest, recycle. If it works for a car, what else does it work for? It's infinite. Any product or service. All right. There's the two books. So there's two other books to add to your wealth building library if you don't have them. Second Chance by Robert Kiyosaki and Money Master the Game by Tony Robbins. Okay, last thing I'm really going to go through today um, is called the Money Multiplier Map. You guys all have the handout. Um, I, okay, all right, so the thing I suggest is, is, is uh, that you watch up here and then take that handout home and study it in nauseating detail later, okay? So this is called a Money Multiplier Map. Now, the thing that we do is we design these maps for all of our clients. In case you guys are wondering the thing I'm doing up here, I'm not asking you to buy anything. I'm not selling anything. But hopefully if you do this concept, if you like this concept and you want to implement it in your life, then you're going to use me to do it. No, you're not paying me. I am the life insurance agent that's representing the insurance companies. I'm licensed in every state. I have over 3,000 clients in every single state of the country. So the way that I would get paid if you choose to do this, not by you, right? You guys are never going to write me a check. You're never going to write my company, The Money Multiplier, a check, okay? I get paid the same way your car insurance guy gets paid or your house insurance guy gets paid. So if you go to John Smith, the Allstate man, to buy car insurance, the check that you write is not to John Smith, is it? You write it to Allstate, and Allstate pays John Smith a commission. So I get paid a commission on the policy that you buy. So anybody you buy a life insurance policy from, somebody's going to get paid a commission. So the reason you want to buy the policy from me and not your broke brother-in-law that sells life insurance is because your broke brother-in-law that sells, because everybody has a brother-in-law that sells life insurance. I get it. Yeah. The reason you want to buy it from me and not your brother-in-law that sells life insurance is because your brother-in-law doesn't understand how the banking concept works. Are you with me? So that, just to clear that up, you guys aren't buying anything. I'm teaching you this. But if you do do it, what the heck happened there? Let's go back. But, but again, all right, so the thing is, if you do do it, hopefully I'm the one you'll do the policy with. Okay, so for all of our clients, the thing that we create you is this money multiplier map. Now, after I go through this, you're going to see how I was able to pay off almost a million dollars of debt in 39 months. I'm not going to use my exact example because it'll take too long. Okay, questions. Remember, I want you to write them down. I will answer them at the end. Any questions, write them down. Short pencil is better than a long memory. Now, okay, so on this map is a map that's created for all of our clients because, uh, and, and the thing is not, okay, not only are we creating you one map, we're updating this map for you every four months, three times a year. Because wherever you're at j just today in your financial life is not where you were one, five, and ten years ago, and it's not going to be where you're at one, five, and ten years from now. Because you're going to go through your financial life, and you're going to buy things, sell things, windfalls, downfalls, raises, and demotions. Agree? So as it's changing, we're updating that map. So let's go through this map and see what is this thing really. So if you notice on the left, it's got year one, year two, and there it's got the policy month, 1 to 12, 13 to 24. It has the amount that he's putting in into the premium. In this example, he's putting in $25,000 a year 
into the premium. The last example was 10,000. It's totally up to you how much you want to put in. You make the decision. And on the premium, it can be paid each month, each quarter, twice a year, annually, and you can always change the mode. So you make the decision. If, if the $25,000 number is not a good number, then take off a zero and make it $2,500 a year. If that's not a good number, take off another zero and make it $250, right? Are you with me? So you choose the amount you want to put in. In this case, this guy is going to start his policy for $25,000. Now, he came to our door, and he had these debts. He had these 12 third-party debts. All right? So anyway, these are the debts that he owes. So if you go left to right on the debts, if you add them all up, it comes to almost $470,000 in debt. I'm going to round down and just call it four fifty. dollars So on your paper, I want you to write down he owes a total of four hundred. dollars and $50,000. Are you with me? Now, on the debts, he owes these 12, part, these 12 third party debts. So who does he owe? He owes Discover, Chase, American Express, Barclays, Lowe's, Nordstrom's, Wells Fargo, private loan. He owes for his car, the BMW, a boat, West Marine, condo, and a house. And in each of those categories, it shows you how much he owes totally. It shows you what his minimum payment is and how long he has left on the loan. Are you with me? Okay. Add them all together, left to right. I'm just going to say 450. Now, the thing he's going to do is he's going to put in $25,000 a year towards that debt. Now, let's just assume there's no interest, which there is, but let's assume there's no interest on this debt. And let's say that you were going to put $25,000 a year towards your debt of $450,000. How long would it take you to pay it off? 18 years. 25 goes into 450 18 times. Are you with me? So on your paper, I want you to have written down that he owes $450,000 total. He's putting in $25,000 a year towards the debt, and it should take him 18 years. Are we good? Now let's walk through this and see how well he does. In the very first month of the first year, he puts in $25,000 into his policy. See this up here? He puts in $25,000. He immediately has $14,300 to borrow. How soon is immediately? Within 30 days. He takes the 14.3, he pays off Discover, Chase, American Express, Barclays, and he pays Lowe's down from 9,500 to 7,600. He takes that money that he was paying those creditors, which if you look at Discover, 160 a month, 200 a month for Chase, 200 American Express, 228 for Barclays. Add all of those up, that comes to 788 a month. Okay, because he no longer owes the creditors, but he's going to play honest banker with himself and pay himself back that money. The same money that he was paying them, since he no longer owes it to them, he's just going to pay himself back. Now, by him doing this, does he have to work harder, change his cash flow, take any additional risk, or lose control? No, he's only changing who gets the money. Before it was them, and now it's to him. Are you with me? So now he's going to pay himself back into this account called the miscellaneous account. Now, a lot of you guys say, what is the miscellaneous account? Well, all that is is a checking account that you have at your bank. I just recommend you have a separate checking account to run all these transactions through it. It just makes it cleaner, and you can see the power of how it works, okay? But if, if, if you want to pay yourself back into your regular checking account and combing of the funds, that's okay, too. It's up to you. I just recommend that you keep it separate. So he's going to pay himself back over the next 12 months. Now, in real life, he's not really going to pay himself back over the next 12 months. He's going to pay himself back, but he's not going to let the money sit stagnant in that account for 12 months. As he's paying himself back, it's going to constantly go to more debt. Are you with me? But I just showed it on the screen as every 12 months just for teaching purposes, or I would have had 9 million numbers up on the screen. Are you with me? Okay. We good? So now we get to the end of the first year, beginning of the second year. We put in the policy premium again of 25000 in month 13. Now how much can we use? We got a total of 148 that we can use off of that, 25. How soon can we use it? Immediately, within 30 days, okay? So now the thing we do is we take the 148 plus the 9400 that we've been paying ourselves back the previous 12 months, and we got a total of 243. We take that 24-3, and the thing we do is we pay off Lowe's, we pay off Nordstrom's, and we pay off Wells Fargo, 
and we pay the BMW down from 17000 down to 15000 So now we take that money, we were paying those three creditors, which is 287 a month to Lowe's, 276 to Nordstrom's, 271 to Wells Fargo, add that up, add it to the 788 we were paying ourselves back, and now we're paying ourselves 1622 a month. Are we working harder, changing our cash flow, taking any additional risk or losing control? Nope, we're just living life, man. Sun goes up, sun comes down, right? Okay? Now, if you notice, what month is this? This is month 19, it looks like. In month 19, or I guess it's 18, okay? In month 18, we now have enough money to pay off the private loan because the thing that we've been doing is paying it down each month because at this point it only had seven months left. You see it? So all we did is continue to pay the 922 a month onto that loan, and it paid off during the normal course of the loan. So now because that paid off, the guy says, well, hey, I've been paying 922 a month anyway. I'm used to paying it. So let me add the 922 to the 1622 and pay back myself 2544. Either way, if he wants to do it or he doesn't do it, he doesn't have to. He's in control, right? He just decided to take the 922 a month and add it to what he was paying himself back. Are you with me? Because he was used to doing it anyway, right? So now we continue on. We get to the end of the second year. Here we go. Do I hit this button again? I'm trying to go forward. And I go back. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Okay. I'll skip that part. All right. Let's go here to the end of year two, beginning of year three. Month number 25. Now we put in 25,000 again. How much can we use now? More. 22 and some change. Are you seeing that each year the policy gets more efficient? It's not me telling you. It's in your policy contract. Every day is better than the day before. Okay? Today is better than yesterday. Tomorrow is better than today. That is in your policy contract. If it doesn't look like that, then don't accept it, don't sign for it, and don't pay for your policy. So now we got the 22 available, plus we got the 25 available that we've been paying back the previous months, month 13 to 24. So we got a total of 48,000 to use. We take the 48, we pay off the BMW, and we pay down on the boat here, Bill. Okay, all right. So like on the Marine Bill, we pay it down from 47 to 8,000. All we do on the BMW payment, which is, was 500 a month. All we do is add it to the $2,544 we were paying ourselves back, and now we're paying ourselves $3,044. Two months later, we pay off the West Marine bill. We got enough money to pay the West Marine bill. That frees up $1,261 a month. We add, okay, $1,261 to $3,044. We're now paying ourselves $4,305. You guys with me? Seeing how this works? Got it? Okay, now, watch this. If you guys have been sleeping, you got to watch this. This is pretty cool. Watch this. Hang on. This is really good. So just hang on. Just hang on. I'm, I'm drinking the Kool-Aid. You guys are going to be drinking the Kool-Aid after this. Is done too. All right. Now watch what happens after three years. Okay? How long have we been paying premium so far? We've been paying premium for three years. Actually, two years in a month. Because, right? Because we're on the 25th month. We pay 25000 in month one in month 13 and month 25. So really, we're only two years and a month into that. So how much have we put in so far? 75, 25 a year, right? Well, how much are we using of that money that we put in? Well, remember the first year, we used 14 and some change. Second year, 14 and some change. Third year, 22. So we're using 50,000. So we've put $75,000 into our policy, right? But we're using, up to this point, we're using $50,000. How much is in our policy? We put in 75, we're using 50. How much is in the policy? 25,000, right? Nope. All $75,000 is still in your policy. It's growing and it's compounding at that guaranteed tax-free growth rate and the government's completely out of your hair. There's no interruption of compound interest. Go Google uninterrupted compound interest and see who comes up first. All right? There's no interruption of compound interest. Your, all your money is still growing as if it was all on the count. Because here's the deal. Any time that you borrow 
from your life insurance policy, it's not your money that you're borrowing. You're simply putting your policy up for collateral, and you're taking a loan from the general fund of the insurance company. So your money is continuing to compound and grow, even though you're using it. I don't know of another vehicle on this planet that allows you to do that with these features and benefits. And if you guys know of one, let me know, because I've been looking for 15 years for something better. If you guys got something better, let me know what it is, and maybe I'll stop teaching this and start teaching what you show me. It is a game changer. When you build that money and you're using it and there's no interruption of compound interest. All right. So let's move on. We get to the end of the third year, beginning of the fourth year. Now we put in 25000 How much can we use now? More than we put in, almost twenty six, right? So anyway, all right, remember earlier that I said you would never, ever, ever, ever want to stop paying your premium into a whole life policy in a mutual company that pays, okay, that pays dividends, that's designed and specifically engineered for this concept? You would never want to stop because how many times a day would you give me 25000 if I'm going to give you back almost twenty six? You'd do it all day long, wouldn't you? So now we got the twenty six almost plus almost the 42, we got 67.9, okay? So now we take the 67.9 and I pay down the condo. I don't have enough to pay it off because I owe 81. Well, remember I said, I don't want you to change your cash flow work any harder. So I'm not gonna pay myself back more than the 43.05 that I was previously paying myself back because I'm gonna continue to pay 43.05 because I didn't pay it off. Are you with me? I don't have enough money to pay it off. But if you get now to the end of the fourth year, month 48, now we have enough money to pay it off. So that frees up, okay, a total of 1179 a month that we were paying to the condo, add it to the 4305, and now we're paying ourselves 5484. We're now at the end of the fourth year, beginning of the fifth year, month 49. Now we put in 25, how much do we have? Almost 27. How soon can we use a 27? Immediately, within 30 days. So we got the 26.8 plus the money we were paying ourselves back the previous 12 months, month 37 to 48, which is 51.6. So 51.6 and 26.8 is 78.4. We take the 78.4 and we pay the house down. Now remember, back when we started this, we had 12 third-party debts, and we said it was going to take 18 years to do this. We only have one debt left the house, and are we getting close to 18 years yet? We're in month 49, are we not? We're at the end of the fourth year, beginning of the fifth year. So you think we may be a little ahead of schedule. So now the thing we do is pay the house okay, down, continue to pay ourselves back the same amount of money because I didn't pay the house off. Now we get to the end of the fifth year, beginning of the sixth year, month 61. Now we put in premium again. How much do we put in? 10,000. Well, why only 10? How much were we supposed to put in? So why are we only putting in 10? Well, here's why. On the policy, all right, so anytime I design your policy, I design it so it has high immediate cash value immediately. So in this case, okay, there's two parts of the policy. There's something we call the base premium and something called the paid up additions rider premium. Okay, so in this policy, the base premium is $10,000 or actually 40% of the 25. The other 15,000 is the paid up additions rider. In the beginning stages of the policy, the base premium doesn't have cash value and all the cash value is coming from that paid up additions rider. Now the policy is older, it's more seasoned, it's more efficient. Now the paid up additions rider is not as effective and the base premium is driving the cash value. So we drop off that paid up additions rider, and now we're gonna pay 60% less on the premium that you started with, okay? Because now that base is, is driving the cash. I want you to think of it this way. Have you ever seen the space shuttle take off into space? They got a space shuttle and two booster rockets, and when that shuttle gets way up in the air, what happens to those booster rockets? They fall off, and they fall off, why? Because they're no longer needed, they're used up. So like I flew over here in my airplane from Florida, so we cruised over here at 27,000 feet. Actually, my son, Zach, he's our pilot. You'll meet him as soon as he gets out of bed and comes over. 
Um, but 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 um, so yeah. So okay. So the thing we did, we flew over here at 27,000 feet. We'll fly home tonight at 28,000 feet. So as I'm okay. So the thing is, as I'm taking off and as we're okay going up, okay, just the altitude, I'm gonna burn all the fuel, right? I'm burning a lot of fuel. But now when I get way up there and the air is thin, I lean back the mixture. I'm burning way less fuel because it's more efficient. Does that make sense? So kind of think of that policy, that paid up additions rider as that, or, or, or as those two booster rockets dropping off the space shuttle. Okay, so now we put in 10,000. How much can we use right away? That's right, 13. Now I'm not a math genius or anything, but I'll tell you this. If I put in $10,000 or something and I can instantly use 13, that is a 30% increase on my money. How much of your money do you want growing in 61 months at 30%? The correct answer would be all of it. So are you ever, ever, ever going to want to stop putting premium into this policy because every year it's going to get more efficient? Every single year I put in 10. Are you ever going to want to stop putting premium into that policy? Absolutely, you would never want to do that because how many times a day do you want to show up in the parking lot and every time you give me $10, I give you 13 You'll do that all the time, won't you? I mean, I mean, 24-7. I bet you'll even skip church on Sunday. Oh, sorry. That's pushing it too far. Sorry about that. All right. But anyway, you're going to show up to pay that premium, are you not? You never, ever, ever, ever want to stop paying your premium. And if you ever think you do, then you guys do not need financial counseling. You need severe psychiatric care. And I'm a chiropractor, and it's probably something that has to do with the brain stem and the atlas, so I might be able to help you with that. All right. So now we're going to start a second policy, a branch office. Is it okay to have a second policy, a branch office? Well, let me ask you right now, the checking account that you have at your bank, is there just one bank or are there several branch offices? There are several. So can you have several branch offices of your bank, the Bank of Dan? You can have several of them, can't you? Right? So now we're going to start a second policy. Now, I will tell you that if you work with me, you will never wait more than five years to start a second policy. I have over 3,000 clients now in every state of the country. 91% of my clients that have been with me a year or longer come back for more. Of those 91%, about 70% of those come back before the first year is up to put more policy premium in or to do more policies. Now, the reason that I tell you that is because if this concept didn't work, are you really think nine out of 10 are gonna come back for more? Absolutely not. So now we start another policy. So now let's see what we have. We're at the 61st month, okay? We put in 10, we've got 13. We, okay, and, and okay, the brand new one, 25, we have 14. So 14 and 13 is 27 plus 65. We got 93,000. How much do we owe on the house? Only 90. So we completely pay off the house. So all 12 third-party debts are completely gone. We paid every single one of those guys off. And how long did I say it was going to take you to do it? Didn't take 18, 10 years. We did it in five years in one month. How happy do you think this family was? Is there anything stupid, ridiculous, or idiotic that we did? Now, let's peel back the onion a little bit more. Let's see, how much did they actually put in to pay this debt off? Because remember, they had almost $470,000. Well, remember back in year one, they put in 25. Year two, 25, three, four, and five. That's 125 plus 10 for 135. The new policy for 25, 160. They injected $160,000 of outside money, kept their cash flow the same, paid off almost $470,000 of debt. They didn't do it in 18 years. They did it in five years and a month. Could they have went faster if they wanted to? Yes. Absolutely. He could have put more in premium. He could have paid himself more back. He could have um, started more policies earlier. So he could have went faster. Could he have went slower? Yes, he could have not put in 25000 premium. He could have said, I'm only going to put in 2500 or whatever that amount was. He could have not paid himself back. He could have um, not started another policy. So the speed that you go with this is totally up to you. It's completely up to you because there's no risk in this whatsoever. As a matter of fact, nobody in your state or any state in this country has ever lost money in a whole life policy in a mutual company that pays dividends. It hasn't happened. Go look it up. 
um, right? So the only risk factor is you, is you and how you use the policy. And who do you know better than you? Nobody. Okay, sir, I'll get your question. I want you to write it down. I will get it at the end. Okay, now, now are you seeing how I paid off $984,000 in 39 months? I just went faster. That's it. It doesn't matter the speed that you go. Time is going to pass anyway, is it not? All we're doing is adding one step in your financial life. All right, now, watch this, okay? This is another pretty cool thing. I, okay, so, all right, so on your handout, I want you to look at the last two debts. I want you to go to year one, and I just want you to look at the condo and the house. I don't even want you to look at the first 10. And I'm going to show you what will happen to your account if you just continue to pay yourself back the amount of money you already agreed to pay the bank back. No, all right, watch. On the condo, on the condo, okay? So how much on the condo is his monthly payment when we started? Eleven seventy nine a month. You see that on your chart? How many months, okay, back when we started, did he have left to pay on it? 122. Now, I've been doing this for 61 months. So I have to be fair and subtract 61 from the 122. So that means I would still have 61 months left to pay on the condo had I not implemented this. Would I not? I would still owe 61 more months. But now that I paid it off, I'm just going to pay myself back the money that I already agreed to pay the condo bank. Got it? So if I do that, I'm going to show you how much more money that we have. All right? You see that? So if you just continue to pay yourself back the money you had already agreed to pay them, you would have an extra 71000 in your account. Okay? Now, I'm going to go to the house. How much is a house payment a month? Is that right? Is that what's on the sheet? Fourteen twenty-one. And so how many months did we have left when he showed up at our door? 219 minus 61. That means he would still have 158 months left to pay on it, would he not? So if he continues to pay himself back the amount of money at the same amount of time that he had already agreed to pay the bank back before he showed up at our door, can you see if you add those two numbers together, he would have 295000 more in his account plus the house and the condo. Are you seeing that? Now, it gets better than that. Because remember, inside of the policy, you have a guaranteed tax-free growth rate. You remember what that is? So we got to add the 4% on those numbers. It's 4%. That's not me telling you the growth rate. That's the guaranteed growth rate inside of your policy. All right? It's in your contract. So now look and see how much he would have when you add up the numbers. If he does nothing more than, pay, than just pay himself back for the condo and the house, he would have an extra 371000 in his account plus the house and the condo, all without working harder, changing his cash flow, taking any additional risk, or losing control. If he does not do this, who gets that money? The bank. Who's getting all your money now? That's why they're so big, and that's why they're building them everywhere, Right? So who uses this, this concept? Who uses it? The University of Michigan pays their fo head football coach. I was about to give a live presentation, and I was in Denver, Colorado. I was about to give a live presentation on November 16th of 2016. I don't remember that's the day I was going to give the live presentation, but I remember the date because I got there early. I opened up my computer. Yes, Larry, I do get places early. Sometimes I get places early. I showed up early that day. So I got there on November 16th, of 2016, and I opened up the computer, and I went to look at sports scores. That's what I did, ESPN.com. And here's this article, Cash Value Life Insurance Makes Jim Harbaugh the College Football's Top Paid Coach. So, okay, how come they do it? Because they pay his salary, he gets a good salary, and the University of Michigan gets all their money back. Now, don't you think the University of Michigan is glad they're getting their money back, especially how he's been performing as a coach? Yeah. yeah. But I know you guys at Penn State, you like him performing that way, right? That's right. You don't like him to, to win, and he hasn't been. So, again, this is how the University of Michigan does it. Walt Disney. Walt Disney wanted to start Disneyland, but after failing in the pursuit of traditional means of financing. So isn't that crazy? So anytime you need to borrow money from a bank, and the thing is you need it, the bank doesn't want to give it to you, but then when you have money, the banks want to knock on your door and give it to you. Isn't that the weirdest thing ever? So anyway, he couldn't get bank financing. So he had to provide his own financing. A large part of it came by collaterally borrowing money from his cash value life insurance. So who knows if there would even be Disneyland if there wasn't for life insurance? I don't know for cash value life insurance. 
Ray Kroc with McDonald's. Okay, Kroc didn't take a salary for eight years, and to help with cash flow, he borrowed money from his two cash value life policies to help cover the salaries of his employees, and he started this advertising campaign we all know as of Ronald McDonald. Actually, where is Ronald McDonald lately? Have you guys seen him? I haven't seen him in a while. I don't know where he's at. <laughs> Maybe Larry. Oh, I didn't say that. All right. How about here? Okay, so here's Pampered Chef using $3,000 that she borrowed from her policy. Okay, uh, all right, it's so back in her Chicago home. So the lady, Doris uh, Christopher, started what's called Pampered Chef back in 1980, and she sold it to Buffett for $1.5 billion. So who knows if she would have ever started Pampered Chef without the policy. Go look up Joe Biden. Go look up J.C. Penney. Go look up Foster Farms. Look up Stanford University. There's tons of stories out there of who uses this that you know. Now that you know this information I just shared with you, everybody should be doing this, in my opinion. I think everybody should do it, because if you don't do it, not only are you stealing from yourself, but you're stealing from your children, your grandchildren, and future generations to come, because you're letting money leave the family. All that money is leaving your family. You see, when you do this, that money stays in a closed system. There's no money being leaked out to other people. So look, okay, so anyways, all right, so us and the super wealthy, us and the super wealthy, we all have access to the same financial tools. Do you agree? The only difference between us and them is how they use it. Now, have you guys ever heard of a guy named Warren Buffett? Now, I don't know when Warren Buffett said this, but I heard it in October of 2008. And I think of this quote every day of my life. Now, again, I'm not about complicated stuff. I like things to be simple. I am definitely not very smart. It took me a total of 13 trimesters to get through 10 trimesters of Logan Chiropractic College in St. Louis, Missouri, because I kept failing classes. Once I passed, okay, all right, so, 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 so after... I passed. It took me an extra two years to get licensed and to be able to practice because I had to take this thing called national boards. And I failed part three of national boards three times, and they only give it to you every six months. So I'm not the brightest candle on the cake. I'm not the sharpest tool on the shed. And some people have even said I'm a couple donuts short of a dozen. <laughs> but I keep things simple. And this is one thing I remember, and this is one thing I understand. And, th and this is what Warren Buffett said. And it's this simple. If poor people would just start doing what rich people do, they wouldn't be poor anymore. How much sense does that make? I'll be passing around the collection basket soon, and you can put it in there. You know how to conduct, right? That's all it is. All we're going to do is mimic and imitate what the rich and the wealthy do. I'm not reinventing the wheel, man. No, man. Okay, the tools have been there for a couple hundred years. The Rockefellers, the Rothschilds, the Morgans, the Stanleys, the Barclays. Go look it up. Only one or two things are going to happen to every one of us in this room. In the next 10 minutes, 10 hours, 10 days, 10 weeks, 10 months, 10, 20, 50 years. Only one of two things are possible. We're either going to live or we're going to die. Now, I like to use the word graduate. You use whatever word you want. But we're either going to live or we're going to die. If we live, are we better off with or without this uh, process I just shared with you? Hopefully, you say with. And it's not an if we die, but a when we die, when we graduate... Are our beneficiaries better off with or without this process? With, absolutely, because of the death benefit. By the way, so how much today did I even talk about death benefit? How much did I really talk about life insurance? No, man, that's just the vehicle that we're using to build our wealth. All right, so like if it was bottles of water, I would sit here and say, hey, this bottle of water, do this, drink this, and this is what happens. It, it just happens to be the vehicle. I don't know of another vehicle on the planet that allows you to do this with these features and benefits. And if you know what it is, let me know what it is. Oh, policies are exempt from lawsuits and liens and judgments in most states. Pennsylvania, I believe, one of them, right? So, remember O.J. Simpson? Found not guilty in the criminal trial of killing his wife and the golden kid, but he was found guilty in the other trial, the civil trial. But did the Goldman family ever get any money? No. Why not? Where was his money? Remember Ken Lay with Enron? He owed all those people money. Did they ever get any money? Why didn't they get it? Where was his money? There's tons of stories like that. Go look them up. The internal growth grows tax-free. 
inside of the policy, the growth of the policy grows tax-free. See, the thing we want to do is pay tax on our money one time, one time only, at the lowest rate possible. And the thing we want to do is get that money into a tax-free environment where it's growing and compounding tax-free and the government's completely out of our hair. Do we not? The loan on the policy never has to be paid back. When you take a policy loan, it never has to be paid back. A loan on the policy is simply a prepayment of the death benefit. You're borrowing against the death benefit. So can the insurance company ever, ever lose? They can never lose because you're guaranteed to die, and the death benefit will always be higher than the cash available and the loan available. So if, not if, but when you die, so any outstanding loan on the policy, the death benefit is going to pay that off because, again, right, so the death benefit will pay it off just because they've already given you that money, and the additional money goes to your beneficiaries tax-free. If there's no loan on the policy, then all the death benefit will go to them because there's no loan to pay off. But the thing is, the, the thing we're doing is we are going to use our money while we're living. So the kids will get enough death benefit. You use the money while you're living, totally opposite of what we've been trained to do. See, okay, the thing that they want us to do, as far as in the conventional world, is they want us just to give them our good dollars today and pay us back with non-guaranteed weaker dollars in the future. We're just changing it. I'm going to use the good dollars today and pay them back with non-guaranteed dollars in the future. And let the death benefit pay off the loan if there's a loan balance, right? Again, I mean, the thing I say, don't leave any more to your ungrateful children than you have to. <laughs> They're getting enough. I love you, Hannah. My daughter's back there. Hannah, so like if both of mom and I die, okay, if, here, I'm going to let her answer this. If a both of us die, mom and I die at age 75, just based on the policies that we have enforced. Now, I have 19 of these policies. I put about a half a million a year in my own premium, and I buy at least one policy every 12 to 24 months. But if both mom and I die just on what we have, and I'm 53, my wife is 55, if we die at age, I think it's 75, okay, on the death benefit, how much are you guys going to get? 32 million. So you're truly leaving a legacy to your family. So, so like if I spend 20 million of that while I'm living and only give them 12, and then hey, all the assets, three guys is that okay? That if you were single. <laughs> huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right, almost done. O almost done. Look. So anyway, okay. So anyway, all right. So like, there's a lot of reasons that you may want to do this, but here's one of them. I want to be a billionaire, so freaking bad Buy all of the things I never had Okay, now, if this is something that you think you want to do, I think on the back of your sheet there's a thing you can fill out and give it to Hannah with your name, phone number, and email in it, so just give it uh, to Hannah. I think it's on the back of your handout. I don't know if it's on these handouts or not. Um, also, if I'll, you want the ebook. Okay, all you got to do is send me an email, Brent, B R E N T, at themoneymultiplier.com, and I'll email you the ebook. Um, and also, here's my contact information, all right? So, anyway, that's my uh, telephone number to text. There's my email. If, if I'll let you want to schedule on my calendar to talk about how this would help you or how it would work for you in your situation, all you do is you go to that schedule calendar, and we'll schedule a 45-minute time block. I call it a strategy session. If you want to watch this full presentation, again, not the one I did this morning, but about the same thing, I have it, uh, okay, so anyway, so, yes, all right, so I have it recorded. So just go to the website, themoneymultiplier.com. You can go to the resources tab and click on presentation. It's all there if you want to watch it again, or possibly there's somebody that you know that's not here that should have been here to watch it. Or if you want to send it to someone else, you can just send them that information there. So, all right, I am done. Thank you for your attention. Appreciate it. Are you going to answer questions? Oh, no, yeah, I'm, I'm, right. I mean, I'm done. I'm ready no, for No, you got to answer some questions. No, absolutely. I, 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 okay. I think, I think Steph has a question. 
Okay, okay, but hang on, because I want to get to his and his, because they rose their hand up. But I, I'll go to you first, you second, you third. I had my hand up first. Uh, no, no, I know. Well, no, actually they did, but you couldn't see them. But that's okay. We're good. We're going to use all of them. So I have no beneficiaries. So does... Well, hi there. <laughs> What's your name? I'll be glad to be the beneficiary. And I'm spending every penny I have before I die. My nieces and nephew get nothing. They already know that. That, that. That's how it. That's how it goes. Yep. So, would it be better for like someone like me to never pay back the loan and always take out against the death benefit? Yes and no. Okay. Um, probably for you, if you have no beneficiaries, right. probably at a certain point in your time, instead of taking out policy loans, the thing you may want to do is take it out as a withdrawal, and now you're surrendering the death benefit. So it's not coming out as a loan, it's coming out as a withdrawal. I would never tell you guys to do that, but in a case where you have nobody and there's no one you want to leave anything to at all, that might be a good situation. But yeah, I mean, but again, it's going to work the same way. So instead of you taking out a loan, you may want to take out a withdrawal. But that's only if you have nobody that you want to leave anything to. I mean, look at Larry over there. You, you don't want to leave money well, to we, investor schooling? We're gonna start, yeah, I was going to say, we're going to start an endowment for investor schooling. I mean, anything, like a charity, yep. any, I, I mean, but, but yeah, it could be taken out as a loan my, or a My whole point was, if you can't pay back the loan for whatever reason, you could always take it out against the death benefit, I guess is my point. Well, yeah, I, well, and again, it doesn't matter if you pay back the loan or not. It's a prepayment of the death benefit. So the loan never has to be paid back. Like me, so, okay, so the thing that I never pay back my policy loan unless I have no use for the money because I want that money out there in motion. I want it working. As a matter of fact, every time my wife asks me, she says, Brent, how much cash value do we have in our life insurance policies? And if I tell her a number that's too high, she gets mad. She says, I don't want money sitting in the policy. I want my green men. That's what she calls them, green men. She says, I want my green men out there working. She says, if anybody's going to sit on the couch and eat potato chips, it's going to be her and not the green men. So now we take the money and we put it into um, like projects, like investments, houses or real estate. Um, actually, the, the thing is, okay, so like go to CaptivaBeachSunset.com. Captiva beachsunset.com. I've just bought that house like three weeks ago. It's a rental property. It's like an Airbnb. It does anywhere from 220 to 270,000 a year in rental mm -hmm. income. So I bought it as an investment. So I took the process of the policy, right? And I'm making the investment because the policy is not an investment. The policy is a process because the definition of an investment is anything that can go down or up. Well, the policy can never go down. It can only increase in value. All right? So I take that to make my investments. I'm buying another property on that same island. It's, it's down in southwest Florida, Fort Myers, Sanibel, Captiva. I'm buying another one. I'm closing on Wednesday on it. I bought one in Island Park, Idaho, up in Idaho. Um, uh, uh, or, you know, uh, yeah, it was back in August. It's on the Montana, Wyoming, Idaho border, 20 minutes out of the gate of West Yellowstone National Park. I bought it as an Airbnb, a VRBNO. So I take the money in my policy. Yes, I can use it for the debts, the expenses, the things that I pay for anyway, but then I use it for my investments. I buy it for the real estate projects, right? Or even if you become a member of investor schooling, right? I don't know. The thing, I'm sure that he charges you to be a member of investor schooling. Can you take the money in your policy and now go be a member in investor schooling and now be able to recycle and recapture and get all that money back? Absolutely. I do it with doctors, dentists, orthodontists. You know, they pay for college and they get all their money back because they run their money through the policy or their equipment that they're buying, their malpractice insurance. It doesn't matter what it is. If you're buying real estate, houses, cars, anything, any product or service. Good. You know, money can yeah. buy you a lot of good things. It's not you everything. Like, uh, so money's not I everything. Tell you a However, it is right up there with oxygen. I gotta you got you gotta answer two more questions, and I gotta tell you what money just bought me. It's hysterical. All right. Right there. Yeah. Well, Pedro has a mic. Two, two, but one's an easy question. Okay. Um so what did you start with? With what do you mean? How much did you start with your whole life? To pay off oh. the almost a million. Yeah, yeah. Well, well yeah. And the thing is, is that I paid 984, 711 in 39 months. 
And the reason I know that number is because when I came home from that conference, I added up all my debt and I told my wife, I said, we got to start doing this, right? right? So I started my first policy with $2,000 a month. I couldn't afford to pay it annually. I started $2,000 a month. As a matter of fact, when I came home and I told my wife that I'm going to start a policy for $2,000 a month, now... So you okay, can put in money at any time. So the time. thing about my wife is a person that does not believe in divorce at all. But that day when I came home and told her we were going to put money into a policy, <laughs> we came close to heading down to the attorney's office to talk about divorce, right? Because she was like, $2,000 a month, we're almost a million dollars of debt, you're going to put it into a life policy? I said, just trust me, honey. You know, I'm going to do what these guys are doing, what I heard. And now, okay, and, and now 13 years later, she's like, Brent, I think we can buy more of these policies. I think we can buy more. So it was better not. to keep you. But, yes, yeah, so, Wait, okay, I so can... the thing is I started my first one at $2,000 a month. Gotcha. Then I did another one for $2,000 a month. Then I did one for $4,000 a month. So I kept adding to that because I saw how powerful this was. And today, as I sit here today, I have 19 policies, and I do about a half a million a year in my premium. So like all my kids, all right, I got three kids. I got my son that'll show up later. He's 19, he's our pilot. So my daughter that's 21, the one that's handing you the handouts. Right. I got another got one that's 32. All three of them have multiple policies. They all live in their own homes. They've all bought their own homes with their policies. They bought their own cars with their policies. So we're truly keeping all the money in the family. There's no money being left. So out. because this is a health insurance policy, is there For life insurance or life insurance policy is pre-existing health conditions a factor it can be on the policy it, it can be so like if you tell me that sir okay so like for example if you say you have cancer or let's say you just had 10 feet of your intestines removed then the policy um okay so then the policy is not going to be on you it won't be on your body but you can own a policy on somebody you have a vested interest in such as a spouse a child a grandchild a niece a nephew somebody that you have an interest in in business and, and, and completely work with it. Okay, sir. Wait, 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 wait. Hold on. You got to do Pedro. He's gonna well, okay, but I got to get to him because he had his hand up while I was talking, and I promised him I'd get to him. So I got to get to him. Anyway, I'll answer as many as you want. Go. Come on. All right. So after the first policy and taking out a loan after 30 days, how soon can I take out an, uh, another policy or multiple policies? As soon as you want. You can take out the policy loan. You can do it as soon as you want. So there's no... Um, okay, so, so yeah, there's no, uh, as far as rule, about how many loans you can take out. As long as there's cash value in the policy, you can take out a loan every single day. And also, the insurance company will never ask you if or when you're going to pay it back. And as far as starting policies, you can start as many as you want as long as you're insurable for that amount of coverage on the death benefit. Because the thing you can't do is you can't overinsure a body the same way you can't overinsure a car or house. So the insurance company is going to take a look at you. They're going to take a look at your age, your gross income, and your net worth, and they're going to assign a value to your life, a life value, which is a death benefit value. No? Oh, okay, good. Who else? Any more? Yeah, me. I, I have a couple of uh, quick questions. Can we do this in cryptocurrency instead of U.S. dollars? No, not that I'm aware of. As a matter of fact, the thing you can't do it is in cash. You have to have a bank account to pay your premium. I have people that have come to me and said, hey, I got all this cash. Can I buy my policy? You've got to have a bank account. 